Go to the book of Ezra, chapter number 8. Amen. Brother Bingham, it is a pleasure to see you. And uh, when you texted me and told me you were heading this way, I didn't know you'd be in in time for church. Or I might be sitting back there by Brother Sam, and you might be up here. And maybe after service, we'll be able to work something out like that. Amen. But what a pleasure it is to see all of you in the house of the Lord. Amen. Go with me to the book of Ezra, chapter number 8, and verse number 21. Remember revival Sunday morning and Sunday night. Looking forward to what God is going to do. It's going to be awesome. And I am so thankful for what God is going to, is doing. Amen. What a crowd, man. Did you notice the crowd we had Sunday? Amen. You know what that tells me? We need to get busy. We need to get busy. We got a building we got to work on and finish. And so, uh, so we need to get our, ourselves pointed that way. Ezra chapter number eight. If you found it, say amen. amen. Verse number 21 through 23. I'm going to go ahead and say at the onset of this message, I'm getting ready to preach slash teach on my least favorite subject in the Bible. And so uh, when I read this, when I read this first phrase of this first verse, you're going to understand exactly what I'm talking about. Ezra 8, 21, then I proclaim to fast. Obviously, I'm preaching your least favorite subject as well. <laughs> then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to inquire of the king, a band of soldiers and horsemen, to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. I want to preach about the river of Ahava. Lord, I pray God, anoint me. I want to hear your voice and speak your word. Anoint our ears to hear. God, bless everyone that's gathered in this class tonight and everyone that's watching online. I pray, God, that you would allow this message, this word, to get a hold of our hearts. And, God, I ask you to do it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise as you're being seated. God bless you. <laughs> Babylon had defeated Israel, took many of its citizens captives. Sadly, while Israel was captive in Babylon, they became so at home in Babylon that when they were allowed to go back to Israel, they decided they enjoyed that wicked kingdom so much that they wanted to stay there. Ezra heard of the condition of the house of God, and the Lord stirred his heart and the heart's of a group of Jews to leave from Babylon and return home to rebuild the house of God. The bottom line was that Jerusalem needed revival. It was broken down. It was in desperate need of the hand of God. And the answer was for the people of God to get busy and bring revival to Jerusalem. Ezra told the king of Babylon that God would take care of them. He said the hand of God is for everyone that's with him and the hand of God is against everyone that's against them. And so the king allowed Ezra, the king of Babylon allowed Ezra to take a band back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Ezra knew that for Jerusalem to have the kind of revival it needed, they had to get to work. They had to get busy and they had to get to work. It's one thing to say we want revival. 
It's another thing to be willing to position yourself to have revival. The kingdom of God needs less talkers and more walkers. Amen. It needs more workers, more people that are willing to do the work that it takes to have revival. I may not continue to go back to this point, but in reality, this message is mostly about how Ezra and those with him positioned themselves to be used of God. They are going back to rebuild the house of God. They're going back to work and rebuild the temple. So most of this message really goes back to this one point that Ezra and God's people were trying to position themselves to bring revival to Jerusalem. The problem was they had to pass through the territory of a fierce and corrupt and violent set of enemies. To add to that problem, they were carrying what the Bible called treasure. They were carrying enough financial resources with them to finance the work that was going to be done on the temple. And so with this fortune of resources with them, passing through the territory of this group of violent enemies of God and God's people. They were in terrible danger for their life and they were going to have to struggle to reach their mission. Ezra knew that they were helpless against their enemies. He knew that without help that this revival for Jerusalem would never really come. And so the Bible tells us in verse number 22 of, Ezra, of Ezra's uh, predicament that he's in. Ezra 8, 22, For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. He said, I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers because I told the king that God was for us and that God was against his enemies. And if I, if, if I hadn't opened my big mouth and said what God was going to do, then I could have asked the king for help. But because I opened my mouth and I said God's going to take care of us, now I back myself into a corner and we have enemies trying to destroy us, and I can't ask for worldly help. And listen, here, here we have Ezra saying, I can't use the help of this world to bring revival to Jerusalem. I can't get the help of the carnal world to help me have revival. It's going to take God or we're not going to be able to have it. Now look, I appreciate, I really honestly do. I, I try, I, 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 as I get a little older, I'm trying my best to not necessarily sound like a grumpy old man in the pulpit. But, uh, but, but I don't always succeed. But, but I, you know, I look around and, and church is a whole lot different than it was when I grew up. When I was growing up, the pastor uh, the pastor wouldn't let drums in the church. And, uh, and I remember when, when he changed his rule and we got a snare drum. And so we had a, a boy playing the snare drum, and the only reason we did that is because it was his grandson that wanted it. And so, uh, and so we had a snare, and it went from a snare drum to a whole set of drums. But, but I kind of grew up in that we didn't have, we didn't have this, this media. We didn't have this projection. I remember when we showed up on Bible study night, and there was a wire stretched across from one side of the platform to the other. And there was a painted, uh, it was paper, and it, it was the book of Revelation, and it was, a, it was a guide. And they would stretch that. Anybody remember that? Did anybody else ever do that? I remember it. And they would stretch that out. And I knew that was old time projection. That was old. And I knew when that thing was up, we were getting ready to be there for a while. I, I go back to the days when... When, uh, when, when they brought a, a blackboard out. I don't know if our kids know what a blackboard is now. 
They may, I don't know, they may or may not. But, uh, but, 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 but now, Brother Dwayne, he brought me an electronic blackboard the other day. Uh, we unloaded it, I still don't know how to use it. But you plug it in and somehow it works with the computer and puts the stuff on it. I, I don't know, uh, that's, that's for somebody about 30 to 35 years younger than I am to figure out. But, uh, but, but, but I appreciate all this stuff. That's my, my point that I'm trying to make is I appreciate all of this stuff. I grew up in a church with an upright piano. I remember we had a revival with the Knoll family. I don't know if any of you old timers remember them, but they came by and we had a, a two or three week revival and, and we didn't even have a grand piano. We had an old upright piano. And, and so, I, but, so I appreciate all this stuff, I really do. I appreciate all the technology and I appreciate the fact that, that all around the world, if, they, if people want to, they could be watching this Bible study right now. And I appreciate all the stuff, but, but we have to remember that none of the stuff brings revival. I appreciate all the things that we have, but those things don't bring revival. There is no carnal solution to a spiritual problem. There is no natural solution to a spiritual issue. Spiritual issues need spiritual answers. And the enemy that we're fighting is a spiritual enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against Hollywood or Washington, D.C. Our battle is not against, against people. Our enemy is a spiritual enemy. And to fight a spiritual enemy, you have to have spiritual weapons. And so here's what Ezra said. He said, I told that king that God was going to take care of us and that God was against our enemies. And now here I am. That sounds good when you're in the palace surrounded by the king's guard. But when you're, when you're a few hundred miles out in the wilderness and you've got enemies coming to steal your resources and to stop you from what God's trying to get you to do, and now you, you know that it is a fight. Now you say, maybe I shouldn't have gone out on that limb so far. Now, now those, of you that, that, those of you that have ever preached, you know that sometimes when you're preaching or teaching, that, uh, that, that, that a special anointing of boldness will get on you. And you'll say something. We're going to do this or we're going to do that. And you'll say it and it'll come out of your mouth. And then later on, you're laying in bed at night and said, did I really say that? I was preaching at youth convention one time and I was preaching about holiness. And I was preaching about how, how we ought to dress and the things we ought to wear and not wear and the junk we should or should not put on our skin and on our body. And, and the whole crowd was up except for one group right in the front. About four or five rows, they were just sitting there looking at me. And so, and so I looked at them and I said, what, you don't believe what I'm preaching? And, and, and then they got up. I guess I made them believe. I don't know. But, uh, but, but, but when, when it was over, I didn't remember doing that. I was just preaching. Boldness to get a hold of you. You'll say some stuff. I was preaching a men's conference a couple of years ago with about, I don't know, what was it, Brian? About 12, 1,300 men or so. Eight, eight, a few hundred men. And I told them if they were letting their wives do all the work in the church and they just sat back and were lazy, I called them all women. I did. I said, what's wrong with you, ma'am? Your spiritual estrogen levels are too high. But I didn't remember saying it until they reminded me after I was done. But I don't take it back because it's true. And so I was preaching at that youth convention. I didn't know I would said that to those kids. I, I, it, I just said it, and I kept on going. And then after it was over, Ellie said, hey, did you know you told them? That? And I said, I don't remember that at all. And so I may say some things tonight that I won't remember, but that don't mean it won't be true. But sometimes when you're speaking and you're anointed, you'll say things that are more bold than what your natural mind really can understand. And then when it's over, you'll kind of stand back and say, did I really, why did I say that? I, and, and I think Ezra was sort of having one of those moments. He's sort of thinking, man, I told that king God's going to take care of us. And here we are surrounded by enemies. And it sure would be nice to have a few soldiers out here. I'm going to tell you something. That the enemy is always trying to get the church to backtrack on its bold claims of revival. Amen. 
the enemy would like the enemy would like to us to not be bold enough to speak that we're going to have revival in 2022 and beyond. He wants us to be afraid to boldly declare what God's going to do. But if we're full of the Holy Ghost and anointed, we have the right to declare that what is in this leather-bound book is for the church today. Amen. I'm kind of glad that Ezra let his mouth get a little bit ahead of his head. Because once he said it, he was bound to it. And so he says, I'm ashamed. He, that's what he said, I was ashamed to ask the king now because I put my, I put my, my words out there. And I said what God was going to do. And now I'm ashamed to ask him for help. So either God's going to help us or we're going to die trying. We're not going to have a natural solution to a spiritual problem. I'm going to tell you, and, and, and this, I guess I quite, kind of feel that boldness coming off on me now. So I may not remember what I'm getting ready to say. But I'm going to tell you, if we're waiting for Washington, D.C. to show up and save the church and save America, we're out of our ever-loving mind. The solution is not in a government building, a political party, or a man. The solution is in the altar. It's in the house of God. It's in the church. If we're waiting for worldly people to make our life easier for us, we're going to be waiting a long time. It's time for us to say, God, if you don't do it, it's not going to be done. And we need to be bold enough to speak things that only God can do. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And, and so I, uh, the, the, the enemy is spiritual. And Ezra said, I told the king. And so since I put my word out there, I refuse to compromise on what I said. And so he said, I, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to send a letter to the king asking for soldiers. What we're going to do, 821 of Ezra. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all our substance. I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava. That river is a, that's a river in Babylon. And uh, the word Ahava in its original language means I shall subsist. I shall subsist. The, the word subsist means to survive at a minimal level. It means to barely get by, to have enough to stay alive, but no more. He said, I, we got to the point, we're at this place where all we're doing is surviving. We're, we're not doing anything but just getting by. It's like I came to church Wednesday, and I'm only going to barely get enough to keep me from backsliding until Sunday, when I can get just enough to keep me from backsliding Till the next church service just subsisting just getting by just barely holding on just barely made he said i got to the point where i got where we were just barely getting by and when we got to that point i decided it was time to make a change i've often said that the secret to sustained revival is to learn how to pray worship and work desperate when you don't feel desperate have you ever watched somebody get really desperate for God? Have you ever watched somebody get really desperate and they come to the house of God? Man, J Brother Jason was just in here a little bit ago. He popped in just to, uh, just to say hey, and, 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 and then he went out for class. But he told me, standing over here, he came. Now, now uh, you, you, we see people come and go, and, and, and in a crowd, it's hard to get to know people and hard to get to know their story. I, I preached on him a time or two. But, but he was living, Brother Paul, and he, you've helped him a lot, and thank you for that. But he was living, he was living in his truck, right? In the winter, sleeping in his truck. His family's from, from, from central Mississippi, south central. He's, what, 19 or so? 20. And, and just on his own, living in a pickup truck in somebody's yard. And, uh, and, and he ends up coming to church. God fills him with the Holy Ghost. He gets baptized. Brother Paul takes him in and lets him stay over there and, and helps him. And he come up and he told me, when he stood right over here with a big smile on his face. I told him, I said, I like that shirt. He said, I got a job. I said, praise the Lord. He said, and I got a car. Because the truck he was sleeping in got taken away from him. He said, I got a, I got a job and I got a car. And he said, 
He said, and the devil can't touch me because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I said, praise, praise God. Sometimes you've got to get to the point in life when you're tired of just barely getting by and you're ready to find a spiritual answer to a spiritual problem. Amen. I shall, Ahava, I shall subsist. I'm just going to get by. Let me tell you, spiritually speaking, and, and I'm not trying to be mean to anybody, but, but, but in our churches, there's a lot of people that are just spiritually getting by, just subsisting, not thriving, not working, not serving in the church, not winning souls, not teaching Bible studies, not doing anything, not teaching a class, not ushering, not working on the music department, just subsisting. Just If, if, if it wasn't for having to go home, they'd have roots grown into the pew, just subsisting. Praise God. Is this all right? If it's not all right, you just got to give me mercy because I don't have anything else for you tonight. But at some point, you've got to get to the point where you're tired of just subsisting and getting by. And when you get to that point, you'll do something to go to another level. Amen. Ezra is back is against the wall. I've opened my big mouth. The enemy's coming to destroy us. They're going to take everything we have. They're going to steal the revival that we're bringing to Jerusalem, and we're just barely getting by. And if I don't do something, it's going to be like this, and nothing's ever going to change. So he said, I got to that point of subsistence, and I said, we're going to go on a fast. Oh, praise God. This is where my amens get shut off, I think. He said, we got we to gotta do something. We, we, we got to do something. If we want to go, if we want to get this revival to Jerusalem and do what, we call, what we're called to do, we got to make some changes. And one of the things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to fast. Ha, hallelujah. Amen. A, Ezra 8, 23. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. We fasted and besought God. We fasted and prayed, and God moved on our behalf. Praise God. I'm going to tell you, when you really get desperate enough to do whatever it takes to have revival, God will hear your prayer, and he'll work in your situation. Praise God. Amen. And so I, I was in prayer a few weeks ago, probably about three weeks ago, and, and God began to deal with me about this, and God began to lay some stuff on my heart, and, uh, and, 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 and so like if God tells me, hey, you're going to have a great revival, I just, say, I just say, God said we're going to have revival, but when God says fast, I want a second opinion. <laughs> and so I was, Brother Austin and I were talking, and I, and I told him, I said, man, I feel like God is dealing with me about, about something. He said, what's that? He said, uh, I, I said, well, I think God's dealing with me about our church fasting at a different level than we have been. And he said, man, God's been dealing with me about the same thing. And, I, and in my mind, I thought, good, now I can blame him. <laughs> let, me just, let, me, let me tell you where I feel like we are and, and as, as a pastor looking at a church. Amen. We, we have, if you don't come to the prayer room before, especially our Sunday night services, especially the last 10 to 15 minutes before we come out in the sanctuary, you are missing some of the most powerful prayer that you'll ever experience anywhere. These young people gather in the middle, and it's not just young people. The prayer room is pretty full, and I'm excited about that. And we have, we don't just go in there to, to chit chat and look around and stare. We got people praying and seeking God. Amen. I've watched our prayer meetings. I've, uh, our ladies are having prayer meetings on Tuesday nights. And we have family prayer on Monday. And, I, and I'm watching as we pray in the altar. We pray in the prayer room. And I've watched, and I feel like the prayer ministry, the prayer, uh, the level of prayer of Bethlehem Church has gone to another level. I really feel that. And we also have some of the most dynamic worship services that you'll ever be in anywhere. You can go anywhere in the world and you're not going to find any more dynamic worship services than what you're going to find here. 
I had a, I had a young man tell me, he told me a, a week or two ago, he said, I travel, I go to churches all over the country. He said, I go here, I go there. He said, I, but, I, but there's no place that worships as good as Bethlehem does. And I'm excited about that. I'm not, I'm not bragging, I'm just, I'm, I'm setting us up for a point. I'm really, I'm excited we have, I got a report, I got a report from Brother Daniel a couple of weeks ago that we had 32 home Bible study teachers in the church, praise God, and then we had to buy eight more sets, so, so we have apparently somewhere around 40 home Bible study teachers, that's awesome. I got a report this afternoon that we have a lot of home Bible studies going through our young ministers, and I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the block party we had. We had, we had a, we, man, we had a, just, I don't know, I was going to say a buku, but I don't know, I, I'm, I don't know what language that is, and I don't want to accidentally cuss in some foreign language, but we, I'll say it this way, we had a whole lot of visitors at our block party, and we've had a lot of good response. We're seeing people come. Our drug program has had a dramatic impact on our community. We're going into rehab centers and reaching people. And we're, we're watching all of this. We're baptizing people. I believe we're up to 26 baptisms this year. Amen. And I'm excited about that, especially since we didn't baptize anybody in January. That's all from the first part of February until through this last Sunday. I'm excited about what God is doing. We have strong prayer, dynamic worship, good outreach, home Bible study. We got a lot. We got programs. If you want to be discipled, if you want to live for God, we have life groups and connect groups, and 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 we have all these things in in program. We have these drug programs. We have a new youth program that we're trying to reach addicted teenagers. We had a lot of stuff going, and I'm excited about all that. But when I look as a pastor at the overall spectrum of the church. The only thing I see where we, I feel like we need to go to another level is in dedication, in fasting for Holy Ghost revival to break the chains and the bands off of our community. Amen. I feel like that's the next level. Praise God. Man, I feel an anointing on me right now. I know it goes against our flesh, and I know it goes against what we, what, what we think, but I'm telling you that the next level of breaking the strongholds of people that walk through those doors is going to be when we fast at another level than what we have been. There's going to be people drive by the church, and there's going to be such a pull of the Holy Ghost that they're going to be knocking on the door hoping somebody will let them in to be baptized in Jesus' name. It's going to another level. Praise God. Amen. Now, now I, hope, I hope you understand. I hope you understand that there's no, I don't think there's anybody. I don't think there's anybody that's having more fun than I am right now. Man, when, 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 when worship is going on and I see people, not, not just preachers, but people praying for people, and, and you watch, and then all of a sudden you got a group going out, and you know somebody else is getting baptized in Jesus' name. And you start, I, there's nobody that's more excited about it than I am. I'm having the revival of my dreams, but I do know this. So I, I'm, not, I'm not complaining. I'm saying, I'm, this is the best thing that, we, that, I've, that I've seen. But I'm gonna tell you, there's still another level. There's still more. There's more signs, wonders, miracles. There's more breakthroughs. There's more, there's more strongholds to be broken. Praise God. Hey, I'm just telling you, if you like what you've been seeing and you like what we've been having, there's a whole other level. There's a whole other step. And it's available. It's available. It's not a million miles away. It's not a thousand miles away. It's a double, a couple of decisions away from saying, okay, God, if this is what it takes to get there, this is what I'm going to do. If this is what we need to do to reach our community, then that's what we're going to do. So I got by the river. I got by the river of Ahava. I got by that place of subsistence just getting by, and I decided I'm not living like this anymore. He said, so, so we, we fasted. And he said, we, we fasted to afflict ourselves before the Lord. That word afflict, it means to stoop or to humble oneself or to bow down, to weaken oneself. It is the submission of the flesh. It's drives and desires to the will and the spirit of God. It is an establishment of priority. It's also an establishment of authority. God, 
I want you more than I want that. God, I want what you give more than what that will give. And God, I'm more hungry to see sinners pray through than I am to indulge my flesh. Amen. Praise God. I should have preached this when I was 40 pounds lighter. The Bible said that the Lord was entreated for them. The Lord moved for them. And Ezra made it to Jerusalem and accomplished his mission. When you survey the scriptures, oh God, I am on page seven of a 17-page sermon. God help, God help everybody. You should have fasted. You'd be getting out earlier tonight. When you survey the scriptures, you find that fasting is a major factor in releasing the power of the Spirit to add p power to prayer. Matthew Henry said, fasting is a laudable practice and we have reason to lament that it is generally neglected among Christians. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in regard to fasting said this, quote, the whole subject seems to have dropped right out of our lives and right of our whole, out of our whole Christian thinking. In the early Christian church, they traditionally fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays. The so-called early church fathers, Jerome, Athanasius, Clement of Rome, etc., all practiced fasting. One day a week, twice a week, whole weeks, even whole months. Martin Luther was criticized because he fasted too much. John Calvin fasted and prayed for the city of Geneva. John Knox fasted and prayed that the, that, that the wicked Mary, Queen of Scots, would be touched. And she said she feared no weapon more than John Knox's prayers. The primary voice of the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, as that revival swept through New England, it was said that he fasted as he, as he prepared and delivered his message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. John Wesley fasted twice a week. Charles Finney, one of the greatest revival leaders in history, was a man who before he would preach revival in a city, he would go and he would camp outside the city and he would pray and fast. D.L. Moody was not unfamiliar with fasting and praying. During the prayer revival in America in 1859, Christians fasted during their lunch hours. They attended prayer meetings in churches near their places of work. In two years, 100 people claimed to convert, or I'm sorry, 1 million people claimed to have converted to Christianity. Richard Riss wrote about the great mid-20th century evangelical awakening in America, and he quoted a man by the name of George Houghton, and this is what he said, quote, the truth of fasting was one great country, was one great contributing factor to the revival. One year before this, we had all read Franklin Hall's book entitled Atomic Power with God Through Fasting and Prayer. We immediately began to practice fasting. Previously, we had not understood the possibility of long fast. The revival would never have been possible without the restoration of this truth. Jesus fasted. Immediately after being baptized in the Jordan River, the Bible said that he went into the wilderness. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days, he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, if thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Satan knew, Satan knew that fasting releases God's power and that Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost and fasting, was more than he could handle. Amen. And so the first temptation that the devil sent against Christ was to try to get him to break the fast so that he could stop him from what was getting ready to happen. But look at Luke 4 and 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Can I tell you that when people that are full of the Holy Ghost begin to fast and pray, we don't only say full of the Holy Ghost, but we get full of the power of the Spirit. 
Amen. And that power of the Spirit, we get sent into our families. I'm going to tell you, that fasting will break chains off your family members. Praise God. Prayer and fasting will break chains of addiction off of your loved ones. Fasting was the final phase of preparation that he passed through before beginning his public ministry, talking about Christ. Look at Mark chapter 9, verses 17 and 18. And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Now look, all you smart aleck fathers, don't go to your sons and tell them that you found them in the Bible today. And whithersoever he taketh him, he teareth him. He foameth, he gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spoke to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. This desperate father took his demon-possessed son. Now look, there, the people debate on how old this, this, this child was, if he was a child, if he was a grown-up. It just says it was his son. I don't know if the boy was, was little or if he was full-grown. Doesn't really, it never says. All it says is that a father, I'm going to tell you, a father, it doesn't matter if your kid's 8 or 18 or 80. If he's afflicted by the devil, you want him to be delivered. Amen. He says, I, I, I went to your disciples and, and, and I tried to get help. And your disciples, these good religious people, the, the hand-picked, the cream of the crop, the 12 best in all of Israel, the very ones that you chose to be the foundation of your church, the ones that you hand-picked, that you're training, and that you're going to build the entire Christian movement on these 12 guys. And these 12 guys you picked couldn't do anything about it. And then Jesus cast the devil the spirit out of this man's son. And the disciples just kind of quietly watch. And then, because they're worried about their reputation here. So look at Mark 9, 28. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? What happened? Why couldn't we do it? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer. I heard you, Brother Randy. And fasting. There are some things that we can do with prayer only. But there are some things that will only happen by prayer and fasting. If you prayed for somebody for a long time and it looks like it's never going to change, there's some things that only change with prayer and fasting. If you've asked God for something and you've asked for a long time and it looks like it's not ever going to happen, some things only happen with prayer and fasting. Amen. In Matthew 6, Jesus again talks to his disciples about prayer and fasting. He talks to them about the motive and he warns them, don't do something just to impress men. Don't do it so that everybody can see you. But notice what he says in Matthew 6, 16. Moreover, when? When? Not if. When? Jesus expects his followers to fast. Y'all aren't amen as much as you were when I was talking about all the great moves we're going to see. When, everybody say when. when. When you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, they may appear unto men to fast. Verily as unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou may appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Amen. Amen. Don't wear a t-shirt that says, I'm fasting. But, but, but what, you, what we need to see here is that he uses both plural and singular. 
When you look in the original, when ye fast, it's plural. He's talking to the group, to the church. And then he says, uses a singular in verse 17, when thou fastest. In other words, there should be seasons where the church fasts together. And there also needs to be times when you fast personally for what you're seeking God for. You understand what I'm saying? He said, when ye fast, there's some things that we need to fast about. And one of those is to take this revival to another level. Amen. But there's some things that you personally need to fast about that is your burden and nobody else carries it like you do. There's some people that are personal to you that nobody can fast and pray for that person like you can. But then there ought to be some corporate prayer and fasting for church matters and for the move of the Spirit. You understand what I'm saying here? Amen. I, I'm, trying to, uh, I'm trying to move on. This was not a surprise to the first disciples because as Jews, they had known about fasting for centuries. From the time of Moses onward, God's people fasted. Jehoshaphat proclaimed to fast. Ezra proclaimed, proclaimed to fast. I'm trying to talk so fast about fasting that I'm getting tongue-tied. The people fasted in the book of Esther. Even non-believers in Nineveh, when they knew that they were facing judgment, proclaimed to fast. In the history of God's people, fasting brought blessings from God in the most difficult circumstances. Fasting played a part in Paul's ministry. Immediately after his encounter with Christ in Acts 9, and he was struck blind, and Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. The Bible said that after, he, after that encounter on the Damascus Road, that Paul fasted for the next three days. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 6, Paul lists various different ways in which he proved himself as a true minister of God. And in verse 5 of 2 Chronicles 6, Paul mentioned that one of the ways that he's proven he was a man of God was because he was in fastings often. In Acts 13, the church at Antioch worshiped the Lord and fasted. It was then that the Holy Ghost said, separate for me Paul and Barnabas. I've got a work for them to do. So when they heard about the work that they had to do, verse number three said, so when they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. It was through prayer and fasting that they got their calling and their commission to do the work of God. At the beginning of this passage, Paul and Barnabas were recognized as prophets and teachers by the church at Antioch. But in verse number 14, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, the Bible said, that, or I'm sorry, in Acts in verse 4 of 14, they described them as apostles. So now that I butchered that up, let me go back and clean it up. They were known as prophets and teachers until they prayed and fasted and got their calling and commission. And then the Bible called them apostles. They got an apostolic anointing on their lives after prayer and fasting. Amen. And I believe there's an, a fresh apostolic anointing coming on the kingdom of God if we'll get a hold of prayer and fasting. Praise the Lord. Amen. So on this missions trip, Paul and Barnabas established new churches, new congregations in the places that they traveled. They would have, they, they would have revival and they would plant churches. In due course, this practice of prayer and fasting was transmitted to these churches. Notice Acts 14 and verse 23, in these churches they built, when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. They didn't just pray and fast themselves. They taught the church to pray and fast. From the scripture, we see that fasting is a vital part of the work of God. Charles Spurgeon said this, our seasons of fasting and prayer at the tabernacle have been high days indeed. Never has heaven's gate stood wider and never have our hearts been nearer to the glory of God. So back to our text about Ezra. I'm coming to a close here. They are at the river of Ahava, at the river of subsisting. 
soon to be overtaken by their enemies. Or they can fast and pray to God for his help. The key to revival in this generation, the key to the next level, is not in our worship, and it's not in our prayers, and it's not in our, in our lively services and all the stuff we have, because we already have that. The key to another level is to embrace fasting for spiritual breakthroughs. Like I said early in this message, we have fantastic worship. Amen. Had somebody tell me that, that coming to church here is like going to camp meeting every weekend. Our discipleship programs are going well. Our life groups are going well. Our outreach ministries are going well. Our Bible study ministries are going well. Our prayer ministries are doing well and getting better by the day. The one last hill to climb to get to the level of revival that I believe we really need to shake this community is prayer and fasting. If your kids, your grandkids, your spouse, your parents, friends, whoever, are drifting from God, it's time to sanctify a fast. Amen. I, I was, several years ago, we had a young man interning at our church. And uh, just a, a cocky young preacher. A great kid, but just cocky as he could be. And... We were, I was sitting in the car with an evangelist, a missionary, and this young, this young man. And uh, somehow the subject turned to fasting. And Brother Patton, we were, there was a family in our church that had been very worldly and carnal. And, uh, and, and that Sunday, the husband of that family came to me and said, Pastor, we're going to fast TV as a family all week long. And, and man, I was excited. I was like, any sign of a pulse on somebody that's flatlined is welcomed. Man, I was excited. I, man, I was like, praise the Lord. You know what? That family's still in this church. This has been whew, 15, 12, 13 years. I don't know. Uh, if, I, if I give too many details, you'll figure out who I'm talking about. We were sitting in the car and and, uh, and, and I said, man, they're, they're going to fast TV all week long. And, I'm, and I, man, I was excited about it. I thought, that's progress. And, and that young preacher said, doesn't count. Said, what? He said, doesn't count. I said, what do you mean? He said, the only fast that counts is if you do nothing but drink water only. I said, what? He said, doesn't do anything. It's a waste of time. I said, I said, you got to be kidding me. He said, nope. And so, Bishop Wilson, I, I, I used you. I hope you don't mind. It's too late now. It's been 12, 13 years ago. I said, the last time Bishop Wilson tried to go on a fast from food, he ended up in the hospital. I said, so Bishop Wilson fasts. When we do a fast, he fasts other things. He fasts stuff, whatever he can do to sacrifice. He said, doesn't count. I said, so you're telling me. But Bishop Wilson hasn't fasted since he got out of the hospital that time. That's right. I said, <laughs> I know I never should have told this story. I ruined a good sermon, or what I thought was a good sermon. I said, you are the most arrogant young preacher I've ever talked to in my life. I said, I can tell that you have never pastored a soul. Because if you cared about a soul, any sign of progress would be a positive step in the right direction. You know, I, I just, I just, I just vented a little bit. It was over. I didn't think a thing about it. The next morning, my doorbell rings. He's on my front porch. Uh, Brother V, do you want me to pack my stuff and leave? I said, I said, no. I just don't want you to be dumb. What, what's my point of telling that story? My point of telling that story is everybody can do something. Amen. I don't expect people that don't have a history of fasting to, to, to start right now and go on a 40-day fast. I, you know, we, we, we want to use our heads. Amen. Can I say this with all love? 
I don't want you to leave. I just don't want you to be dumb. <laughs> Use your head. Be wise. But everybody can do something. Amen. We can do, we can do this, folks. I believe that other level. I, man, I, that, 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 that next level of revival, Brother Craig, is so close I can almost taste it, man. It's just, it's just like, and, and we're, man, we're just, Sister Peggy, aren't we seeing some great things happen? Man, we're seeing some great things. Brother Patton, I'm having the time of my life. But, but, but Sister Ash, I know that there's still just that. Just, are, are, do, you, do you agree with me? Do you, do you agree with me that that's really the one thing that we're not quite up to par on? Can you agree with me that, that, that man, we have great worship, we have great programs, we have great, we have, we have great all kinds of stuff, but, but we, the two things we lack is the pastor's preaching and fasting. But if you'll fast, I'll preach better. Amen. Why don't we stand and lift our hands to heaven? God, I pray that you let this become a burden and a leading of your spirit on our heart. Not because I preached it, not because I said it, but God, I know that there's people in this congregation that have been feeling the pull to fast. God, I know, Lord, these names in these jars, these prodigals, God, they're bound by all kinds of stuff. And one of the greatest things that they're bound with is shame. That if they come, they're, they're ashamed to come back because of all the stuff they've done. God, help us, Lord, to break that tool of the enemy. We don't care where they've been. We just want them home. We don't care what they've done. We just want them home. God, I pray that you help us, Lord Jesus, to take, to take this, this, this word that you've given. I really believe you've given it to us, Lord. And I pray that we apply it to our lives. And God, we begin to not only be hearers, but doers of the word also. And God, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, somebody say, let's go eat. Amen, you're dismissed in Jesus' name.